Okay, thank you very much. Perfect. Now, just as we're waiting for people to join the room, um, I'll start speaking in, in, a, in a few seconds. So, now, thank you very much all for joining us today and thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll start without any um, further wait because we don't have that much time for introduction. So, in this panel here today, we are seeking to understand the impact of COVID on France and Russia and the efficacy of the subsequent economic and political strategies adopted by the two countries and the two governments. One thing is certain in this recovery, um, the post-COVID world will be in many ways very different to the pre-pandemic one. In many ways, countries will act differently. The concept of national sovereignty has been revived. Consumer habits will change. And also this, uh, this recovery is highly li likely to be unequal. There will be clear winners and uh, clear win and clear losers, both in economic terms and in uh, individual terms. As such, this begs the question whether this post-pandemic world will be one of further economic integration in between East and West, um, or one where Russia will forge its own path. And this question begs in itself uh, two, uh, two other questions. How has COVID impact, impacted Russia? And also, um, will this recovery will help um, ensure a lasting, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Um, furthermore, what lessons could Russia maybe teach to other countries and the rest of the world, given its low stringency in dealing with the pandemic and uh, uh, so far apparently robust economic situation? Now, a few points I'd like to make about the Russian economy. Firstly, the current the current strategy is um, on uh, on growth and on recovery is highly driven by public par uh, private public partnerships and large infrastructure projects. Secondly, Russia has very low public debt, around 20% of GDP, yet a triple B minus rating by sovereign rating agencies. It's got a high reliance on natural resources, which represent 20% of GDP and 46% of federal, uh, federal fiscal income. Um, however, there has been a recent worrying uptick in inflation, an aging population and high corruption, which could be worrying factors about the future of the Russian economy. Um, the floor will now take the floor and uh, present the different speakers who will be joining us today. Thank you, Flo. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot to our guests for coming, at least uh, via Zoom. Uh, I will introduce each of you, starting with Mihail Makarov. You are the commercial representative of the Federation of Russia in France. You are a, gradu a graduate of the Meccano Mathematical Faculty of Moscow State University. And previously, you also worked for the international metallurgical company Evraz as a di director of strategic development, going on to become member of the partnership Russian Steel. You also worked as the executive director of the Industry Development Fund. Patrick Erb, you are at the head of the Regional Economic Service of France in Russia. After a master's degree in applied economics, you begin your career in many French embassies, Nigeria, Japan, Israel, Estonia, and in Canada. And you, pursue your, you pursued your public career as an economic counselor in various other countries. You settled down in Moscow back in 2018 and have worked at the French embassy since then. Olivier de Boisson, you are the chief economist for emerging countries at the Société Générale. You graduated from Les Mines de Paris in 1983 and immediately began a career in banks and industry. You have stayed there ever since, working on the emerging market sector. Besides, besides that, you are a lecturer at Sciences Po Paris and you previously took geopolitics cycles at Les Sorbonne. Finally, last but not least, David Lafargue, you are the president of the French Committee of Councillors for External Trade in Russia. Since May 2016, you have been a partner at Gentil Law Firm and head of the Moscow office. You begin your career in Prague at GID, and you headed to Paris before being responsible for the Russian offices and CIS activities in the 20s. More recently, you've been significantly involved in the infamous Bering Vostok affair, which, which represented a significant shift in the business climate for foreign companies in Russia. So we'll talk first about the impact of the crisis, the immediate policy response. And then in the second part of this conference, we'll have your point of view and about insights on the future of Russia and France. 
uh, we'll have then uh, the public will be able to ask you um, its questions. So without further ado, let's get started. And we'll start with a question for Patrick Erbs. Uh, how was Russia affected by the coronavirus shock? Is the GDP recession of 3.1% comparatively lower than in other economies, especially in France with 8.3% recession, highlighting a good management of the crisis by the Russian government, or is it more due to the structural characteristics of the Russian economy? Thank you. Thank you for your question. First of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this forum, and thanks for the organizers to uh, to do this. I think it's very important in the actual context uh, to uh, have this uh, dialogue between France and Russia. Uh, about the, your question, so first of all, uh, Russia has been hit uh, hard by the pandemic. Uh, 4.7 million people was, were infected uh, by uh, coronavirus virus in Russia. It's uh, number five rank worldwide, and officially uh, more than uh, 108,000 people dead uh, in, in Russia. There is a, a gap of death between uh, 2020 and 2019, um, around uh, 400,000 people. So this is a uh, hit uh, very hard uh, of the pandemic in Russia. However, it is right to say that uh, the overall economic impact as measured by the decline of the GDP in volume, minus 3.1%. I think it will be revised uh, around minus 3% uh, in, uh, for, for Russia. It was quite modest compared to other industrialized or emerging countries. How can we explain such a good relative uh, performance of Russia? So I would basically uh, put forward four main factors. The first one is related to the structure of the Russian economy. Its uh, resilience to this crisis can be linked, on one hand, to the relative low importance of SMEs and tradable services as a share of GDP. On the other hand, you all know that the public sector footprint in the, on the economy is, uh, is relatively high. That clearly represents a buffer, notably in terms of, of employment. The second factor is the way Russian authorities handled the pandemic. While very strict social distancing measures have been taken during the first wave, they have been removed rather quickly when the pandemic was peaking. Furthermore, during the second wave, measures undertaken were not as stringent. Relatively speaking, explaining that the GDP contraction for the fourth quarter of 2020 was only around minus 2% year on year versus minus 8% for the second quarter. The third factor is average commodity prices. While oil prices were extremely low back in April 2020, creating a double shock for this commodity dependent economy, the OPEC plus agreement brought a significant support to the oil market along the year. And the average oil price for 2020 printed at uh, $42 per barrel, which is a low but a manageable level for Russia. Eventually, I also see the overall resilience of the Russian economy as, if I may say, a dividend of previous macroeconomic and financial reforms. Over the past few years, Russia has established a microfinancial framework which is solid, predictable, and reassuring for investors. Public finances are sound, and the financial system has been efficiently consolidated. An efficient fiscal rule is in place. The monetary policy and exchange rate regimes has been reformed. International reserves are considerable, and all this created important buffers to handle the crisis and maintain confidence among the public and investors during the crisis. It allowed authorities to deploy in 2020 contra-cyclical macroeconomic policies. Uh, that said, you have to bear in mind that the GDP figures does not tell us the full story. Last year, 
the population in Russia has declined very sharply because of the impact of the COVID on mortality. Besides, households' real disposable income drop by 3.5% year on year. This indicator has been losing around 10% since 2014. This is quite something. Please also note that uh, in 2020, households' consumption and gross fixed capital investment declined by respectively around 9% and 6% year on year. So the crisis did have a significant impact. The unemployment rate after a peak of more than 6% in August 2020 is still above the 5% versus 4.5% uh, uh, prior to the crisis. So the Russian economy still has some challenges uh, to manage, especially on the, the long-term uh, potential growth estimated at only 1.6% by the IMF. But it is true to say uh, that on the short-term basis, the Russian economy was resilient to the COVID crisis and GDP growth and um, uh, will rebound in 2021 and 2022 uh, from 3 to 4%, so this year and next year. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting answer, Mr. Hubs. It's definitely enlightened um, all of us. And on that note, and on the re resilience of the Russian market, I'd like to bounce back to ask you, Mr. De Boisson, a question about um, the Russia's fiscal response. And in a way, asking you, did Russia have the right formula in its uh, response to the crisis economically and maybe politically speaking? And based on Ross Banks and Societe Generale's intimate knowledge of the Russian market, um, do we, well, what could you tell us about this response? Uh, are, are the two responses in between France and Russia's even comparable given the different economic structure, the highly different tax rates, and are Western style Keynesian policies even effective in such an environment given these differences? Or why did we not see as low a dip in uh, overnight rates and central bank rates in Russia as we did in Europe? Is it because of inflation pressures or just a totally different market um, and uh, pol a pol politically economic environment? Thank you. So uh, I think Patrick made a very good uh, introduction, uh, his description about the impact of the COVID. So I will try not to repeat, but I fully agree with the view that there is a specific economic structure in Russia, which explains that the recession has been milder than elsewhere, uh, combined with possibly less severe lockdown measures. Uh, and as the contraction was less severe, we can also expect a rebound that will, will be less spectacular. And uh, there are many reasons for that, but I guess your, your question is, uh, mainly focused on the Russian policy mix, which is, uh, is it adapted to the situation that we see? You know, uh, it's, I fully agree with the view that Russia has entered uh, the crisis with a very good macroeconomic uh, uh, figures in the sense that uh, sovereign debt is very low, the banking system is in good shape, relatively well, capitalized after years of reforms. The central bank is very much credible. And uh, Russia has its buffers, its foreign exchange reserves, its national wealth funds. So the question is why do, why do the authorities seem to be happy with this uh, trajectory, which by some measures is, uh, you could say, disappointing in terms of real income for the population, in terms of growth trajectory. And I think it's true that if we take a step back, that the growth potential of the Russian economy seems to have uh, decreased in the past years. If we remember average GDP growth between 2003 and 2008, so a decade ago, reached 7.7% you know, a year. After the Lehman crisis from 2010, 2014, it was 2.7%, much lower. And after the fall of the oil prices, you know, after 2014, and also the implementation of international sanctions, average growth reached 1.7% between 2014 and 
2019. So approximately the level of potential growth that is estimated by the IMF for the future. So there are reasons for this weak dynamism of the Russian economy. I think these reasons are well known. The, the, the level of capital accumulation is not very high and it's mainly concentrated in the hydrocarbon sector. The demographics are not very favorable as we all know and there are issues with the investment climate uh, and also there are these sanctions which explain that for instance the level of FDI in the Russian economy is very low compared to, to other larger economies you know and these factors do explain the reduced potential growth. So for the authority, the choice is whether to push much harder for a growth rebound. Apparently, as far as I can see, this choice is not being made. And we see that the policy mix remains conservative. Uh, the government has launched relatively moderate stimulus packages. You know, depending on how you measure them, it's between four and 8% of GDP, but spread over two years. And it's not clear, at least to me, whether all these measures are additional when compared to previous announcements. We see that the government has no intention to draw on the National Wealth Fund. At least uh, it has not drawn until now, you know. And, uh, and uh, in the draft budget that is being uh, devised for 2021-2023, there are uh, reduced expenditures, you know, public expenditures, including cut in defense spending. So we have a policy mix that remains very much, you could say, conservative. Uh, possibly also this makes uh, Russia much more resilient to to uh, adverse win, uh, adverse, uh, you know. Uh, events in an international capital markets, less dependent on, uh, on sanctions, as we, as, we, as we saw even recently with the newly announced sanctions by the US administration. It had a, a moderate impact, you know, and Russia seems to be well prepared to withstand that, but uh, it's consistent that it doesn't want to expand much more rapidly uh, its uh, measure to sustain economy. So we have something which is completely different than what we see in developed markets, but which also is quite different from other large, you know, uh, emerging markets. Just think that inflation is resilient in Russia. So for instance, it's not the case in China. We have no inflation in China. Uh, it's more similar the, with what we could see in countries like Brazil, you know, and Russia is among the very few countries that has started to hike its interest rates this year, you know, after reaching a low uh, last year, uh, they have hiked twice and now short term rates are at 5%. And it seems that we are at the beginning of an upward cycle. So this will probably also act as a small break, you know, on the recovery. There is also there was also a shift in the Russian economy in the last five years, which is positive in terms of uh, uh, macro assessments. But uh, you know that the, that, that the the central bank of Russia is implementing, you know, um, a credible anti-inflationary policy, but which translates into positive real interest rates. This was is in sharp contrast to what was the case before 2014. And it's one of the explanation of the slower growth uh, potential. So taking all that into account, it's probably the right choice, but we cannot expect, you know, uh, uh, the economy to bounce back uh, uh, very, very sharply this year. And at SOCGEN, we have a view that uh, growth will be above 2%, but will not reach the 3 to 4%. You know, that some people, some do expect. We have a more conservative view on, on growth for this year. So I hope I answered you your question regarding this policy mix of Russia. You did, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we'll have a question for Mikhail Makarov. How has the COVID crisis impacted Euro-Russian trade? What measures has the Russian government taken to support its export market? Thank you. Do, do you hear me? Is it okay? Yes. Yes, we're going to hear you. Uh, 
Good, good. Uh, on my own behalf, first of all, and uh, on behalf of my trade uh, mission of the Russian Federation in the French Republic, I cordially welcome the participants of the Yad Frank Russian Business Club. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has raised questions, of course, for the world community, and not only about the effectiveness of health systems, but also more global ones concerning the criteria for assessing the quality of the work of governments of various states, of the structuring of the economy of entire countries and the consumption model. Uh, over the past year, political experts and economists uh, have been actively discussing what the world will look like after the end of the pandemic and uh, who will emerge uh, victorious from this situation. And of course, if uh, the economic, uh, economic uh, consequences are already relatively clear, uh, for sure. Uh, national economies, as expected, have reduced the level of production and consumption. And of course, small and uh, unfortunately, medium sized businesses have suffered the most than the political effects. So the pandemic are uh, not so clear predicted. As a representative of the economic bloc, I would like to express some thoughts uh, about the changes in the economy and trade after the pandemic without touching, of course, uh, global and political issues. So we are, we are not about politics, uh, fortunately. Uh, what will the coronavirus lead to, in my opinion? So there are seven issues, and uh, I would like to probably to, to, uh, to express um, each of them. So first of all, uh, closed economies, borders, and markets. Uh, to stop the spread of the virus, states were forced to close their borders, of course, and this um, for sure affected several billion people, led to the destruction of production and trade chains, uh, the collapse of entire industries, uh, those functioning is associated with foreign trade, I mean, uh, of course, transport, logistics and tourism, and uh, this one is uh, more about uh, French economy. Uh, for reference, for example, at the end of 2020, uh, French exports fell by 16% to uh, 418 billion euros compared to 2019, while exports uh, fell by 13% to 500 billion euros. The negative trade balance reached uh, more than 80 billion euros, uh, which is the worst performance since 2012. Uh, in addition, the market uh, adapted. Uh, I mean, uh, people began to consume local products, uh, businesses began to form sustainably, uh, sustainable supply chain focused on the local market and proximity to the, of course, and customers. In fact, we see a new round of uh, anti-globalization. So it's fortunately or fortunately now we, we don't have the idea. And for reference, for example, in 2020, the French government offered, for example, Renault, uh, a 5 billion euro state guaranteed loan in exchange for stopping uh, the development of production facilities abroad and uh, preserving uh, sites and jobs in France. And uh, of course, the tendency to focus on the domestic market, domestic producers and consumers will, uh, will, take, will take root. Uh, so the second issue is, uh, of course, productivity. The business had to break the whole scheme of functioning almost at once. Uh, it was a shock. Uh, thus, according to the calculations of the French Federation of Small Enterprises, up to 55% of uh, semis uh, enterprises may not survive this crisis in the country. And the ability to withstand the impact adapt to the existing economic realities, start working more productively, and the low cost, all this uh, will be the key to survival. Uh, to work remotely, of course, companies have switched to new ways of communication. Uh, we, um, everybody of us know uh, Zoom, Skype, Facebook, WhatsApp, et cetera, et cetera, and people have learned to work remotely, uh, quickly and efficiently. And of course, COVID-19 has given a boost to innovation in the workplace. I'm convinced that uh, we will witness an unprecedented uh, record increase in the quality, productivity, and customer focus of the business. Uh, the third issue uh, is uh, development on the online economy. 
of course, the current uh, crisis has uh, given uh, an impetus to the development of business at a distance. Uh, I mean, online trading, telemedicine, entertainment, etc., etc., uh, such as online cinemas and etc. Uh, until recently, uh, virtual visits to museums seems absurd for us, but today it's a given. And of course, after the removal of restrictions, people will want to personally to go to the doctor or to the store. We are not talking about a 100% transition uh, to a virtual plan than the trend, but I think we will be more and more pronounced. And the same applies to the optimization of business process by which we mean the partial of or complete transfer of stereotypical operations and businesses, business tasks under the control of a specialized information system or hardware and software complex. And the result is the release of human and financial resources to improve uh, labor productivity and the effectiveness of strategic management. And of course, I'm sure that further automatization will deepen in the following areas. I mean, industrial enterprises, uh, orders, purchase uh, of materials, production, self packaging, delivery, and reporting. Of course, dangerous uh, production and mining. Um, I mean, uh, robotization and improvement of uh, conveyor belts, for example, or control of environmental pollution and consumption of natural resources. Of course, it's IT companies. I mean, test management between programs, testers, um, and salespeople and technical uh, customer support and back trackers, for example. Yeah. Everything uh, probably will be 24 per seven online resources. Uh, service companies, individual services and telephone consultations that require the implementation of a CRM system, document flow, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it's banking system because um, we all know uh, about the support of the client database, the mechanism of unbiased decision of lending, online banking, and protection against uh, fraudulent transactions. Of course, it's analytical, legal, and research center centers, monitoring, analyzing of large databases uh, that are being updated. Uh, statistics and socially, uh, so uh, sociology, um, search for legal and insurance uh, precedents, meteorology and disaster prevention, and et cetera, et cetera, including security and movement tracking applications. Uh, instant notification of violations. So the fourth issue is, of course, strengthening the role of the state in the company. Again, fortunately or unfortunately, the coronavirus uh, crisis has shown that only the state can uh, regulate the market in a panic. And uh, without government intervention, many thousand, uh, thousands of companies would uh, have gone bankrupt and millions of people, millions of people would have uh, lost their jobs. And the support measures uh, vary, but the meaning does not change. So in France, for example, more than 300 billion euros have been allocated for the state guarantee of loans uh, to enterprises, especially in the medium-sized businesses. Um, granting loans or entering into the capital of a company is being rescued uh, will somehow increase uh, the state's uh, share in the economy. As an example, um, uh, the airline company Air France, it was allocated state aid in the amount of 7 billion euros, but these funds were not enough and uh, in the face of airlines deteriorating financial situation, uh, the government is currently considering increasing its stake to 30% in its capital. Now it's about uh, 14. So the fifth issue, um, so we have, we have uh, three, more, uh, three more issues. Uh, fifth issue is social, of course, the social responsibility of business. I mean, public investments into private business will lead to increased control, which will have a significant impact on the state business society and nature relationships. So the 5 billion, for example, euros assistance uh, to the Renault, uh, Renault Group that I mentioned earlier is, a, <clears throat> is also um, accompanied by a demand from the French government to dramatically increase investments in the development of eco-friendly modes of transport and electric vehicles. Uh, in fact, the triple criteria concept has received a second wind, uh, the concept of building uh, businesses, a business according to which uh, entrepreneurs and managers should take into account not only financial indicators. So the six issues, it's uh, of course changing con uh, consumer and behavioral habits. So uh, we now understand that consumers have become more uh, scrupulous about the, their health, safety and privacy. So business will have to take this into account, more eco-friendly products, 
mostly locally pro produced requirements for personal data protection, uh, rare profiling of places of uh, residence to ensure social distancing, development of delivery services and online customer interaction. And the last one, it's unprecedented uh, development of healthcare. Of course, COVID-19 has shown the imperfection of health system in almost all countries and uh, its unwillingness to face threats of a global scale. And governments, businesses, and societies, I think, have realized the need to develop medicine as a priority. The current crisis, in my, in my opinion, will lead to an explosive innovative uh, development uh, of healthcare. I mean, of course, biotechnology, vaccination, new methods of diagnosis and treatment. Uh, there's no doubt that pharmaceutical companies will soon become the engine of innovative uh, advanced developments. So, um, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's more about it. And uh, uh, in conclusion, um, I would like to confirm our commitment to the further development of Russian-French trade and uh, economic relations, uh, despite the restrictions caused by COVID-19. Uh, a large number of bilateral um, events are currently taking place in, uh, in an online format. Uh, in particular, uh, on February 26, under the uh, patronage of the French-Russian um, Society Platform Trident Dialogue, uh, we held a bilateral forum on artificial intelligence, which for the first time brought together representatives of the French and Russian business circles, research institutes, higher educational institutions, as well as authorities of the two countries. The event was attended in particular by representatives of the Skolko Foundation GIMO, Moscow State University, Bauman Moscow State Technical University, the Minister of Economic Development of Russia, Sberbank, and uh, from France, it's, uh, it was Total, Erlikit, et cetera, et cetera, Dassault System, Salafi, a number of universities and research centers, such as the largest European technoparks of Infolis. In the near future, we plan to continue the dialogue on the climate agenda. And in this regard, we plan to organize a second Frank uh, Russian forum on low carbon industrial development on September 6th at our site. And I would also like to invite you, our French colleagues, uh, to take part in two major international events that will be held in Russia this summer. It's uh, first one, uh, it's in St. Petersburg, uh, International Economic Forum, uh, June uh, 5th, 7th, and the Inaprom Industrial Exhibition in Yekaterinburg, uh, which will be held uh, on July uh, from 6 uh, to 9. Thank you so much for the atten attention. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Makarov, for your complete and very exhaustive answer on the Russian response to COVID-19 and its support to the export market. Right off the bat, I'd like to move on to a question to you, Mr. Lefarg, about um, the support that maybe the Russian government has brought to foreign companies in Russia and more generally the climate, the business climate for foreign companies in Russia at the moment, take into account both the more political side and the recent COVID crisis. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank you for organizing this event that was uh, encouraged very beginning uh, by the, the Conseiller du Commerce uh, Exterior, the French Trade Advisors Association. And we are very happy to, to have such an event because we part of our mission is to support and to promote uh, uh, young people to come to Russia, to work in Russia, to, uh, to have some real uh, relationship here and to develop our trade. Uh, I would like also to correct uh, Flor's introduction uh, because I was not involved as a lawyer in the uh, Bering Vostok case, and I am not involved in the Bering Vostok case. Um, I am, of course, as a chairman of the Trade Advisors Association and together with the French Chamber of Commerce, completely supporting Philippe Delpal, who is himself a member of our association. But we are not involved as lawyers. We are in solidarity with uh, with uh, him in this uh, in this matter. Um, to answer to to your question, in fact, um, I, I will just um, speak about facts and about uh, what uh, people in the business in the French business community uh, say when we when we meet very uh, regularly. Um, you have already all the figures from Patrick, uh, from uh, Mr. Makarov, from Olivier de Boisson. Um, in fact, we just have to see that today, uh, to answer your question, uh, Russia is an open market. 
It's the main difference with most of the countries in Europe. What I mean by that is that there is no more restrictions at all, apart from social uh, distance uh, measures in the metro or the mask in the metro. And there is uh, no more restrictions for business in, uh, in, uh, in Russia at the moment. Uh, the last uh, restrictions uh, that uh, were uh, to have uh, uh, at least 30% of the employees working remotely um, was removed in February. So uh, now everyone is at business. Uh, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's uh, business as normal because we, we are all, of course, careful and there are a lot of changes after this, uh, this crisis and during this uh, crisis and it, it, it it can be, it can be another question how we are going to face these uh, challenges in, the, in in the future. But at the moment, I think what we have to understand, if we speak about support for uh, French companies and what's happening here for French companies, first thing to understand is that French companies are working here. So, so the business is opened, the market is opened. So some companies. Uh, face a lot of difficulties because this is a very hard crisis, economic crisis. So uh, I, I think about all our friends in the, in the tourism activities, uh, hotels, uh, or all of this part of business, of course, it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult for some small and medium companies because uh, they have less work, because they have more delays for receiving income. So it's uh, very difficult for them. And for some other, in fact, uh, 2020 was quite a good year. Um, and for even some of the French companies here, um, there are some opportunities during this crisis. And uh, there are still some companies at the moment coming to Russia to invest in Russia, especially in the, in the new technologies and uh, in some uh, other businesses like uh, this one. So the, my, my first message is to understand that the main difference at the moment is, is really that um, uh, the, the market is open. So we all face the same difficulties, uh, French foreign companies and uh, Russian companies. Now, if you think about um, how, um, uh, let's say, uh, the authorities, the local authorities worked with uh, foreign investors, um, I would go back to all the meetings we had during the lockdown period. At that time, we decided to meet, in fact, on Teams every Friday at two o'clock. We started in, uh, in uh, April uh, 2019. Um, we did not know if it would work. It was our first, uh, of course, uh, Teams meetings at that time with uh, all the difficulties we all experienced. And finally, it was extremely useful because everybody shared difficulties, shared also solutions. Uh, I think about masks, for instance, some French companies provided some masks to some other companies, some Russian companies as well. And if I, if I, I go to the main difficulties, uh, it was uh, first to understand how to work in, um, in the regulations uh, in place during the lockdown period. So uh, can I work? Can, uh, can my uh, company uh, continue to work? Can my employees in my plant can continue to work? Uh, and I must say that uh, um, the relationship with uh, federal authorities and with local authorities um, in general really helped. So uh, a lot of big French companies uh, had discussions with uh, uh, especially local authorities and found solutions about, about their uh, business. And the second main problem we faced and we are facing still is, of course, uh, the, the, the closing of the borders. Uh, it's a huge problem, especially when you are a, a foreign investor, when you can't, uh, as a manager, visit uh, your uh, subsidiary, your plants in Russia. Some, some people haven't come here for, for a year, in fact. Um, and uh, it was the same problem for some uh, French people working for Russian companies uh, or French companies here and who were blocked in, in, in France, for instance. So that was really the problems we faced. And also for this, we acknowledge that uh, a lot of efforts uh, were made uh, by uh, the authorities, also with the support of 
uh, our French embassy here, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, our, our association, we, we finally achieved some quite concrete results and uh, help to, uh, to make things, uh, you know, working at the end. Um, but it, it was really the most difficult things. Now, if you see this global situation with, in fact, a, a lockdown period that was only during April and June uh, 2020, it explains why there was probably much uh, less uh, massive help from the state uh, to, uh, to the companies. It went to big companies. Uh, it was sometimes more difficult for small and uh, medium uh, companies. But in general, uh, French companies and international companies uh, also uh, benefited from, from some uh, measures. I think especially of the, of the decrease of the social taxes that uh, apply to all companies and, of course, uh, also to uh, to French companies. A last word about um, what you call uh, the current climate. So, uh, in fact, it's something very strange because we have, uh, I think it's uh, Patrick who, who, who said that before, uh, we have a, a, a micro financial climate uh, that is uh, solid and much better than a, a few years uh, ago. At the same time, we have a huge pandemic crisis that means also a huge economic crisis. We still have a lot of French investments in Russia. So we are still the first or the second investor in Russia, the first foreign employer in, 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 in Russia. French companies are not leaving, but there are some big difficulties um, that make uh, the future quite uh, uncertain. Of course, I think about sanctions, economic sanctions. And uh, we uh, definitely don't need to have, in addition to the crisis, some more economic sanctions and also some more local restrictions sometimes. I think everything together uh, makes uh, the climate a bit complicated sometimes. But we are uh, working and French companies are, are still uh, and are in the future very involved in the, in the market here. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting answer. We just ended the first part of this conference and we are going to uh, quickly open the second part. Unfortunately, I fear that uh, the public won't be able to ask a lot of questions. So please tell us in the chat your questions and we'll see if, you ha if we have the time to answer them. The second part is on uh, is about the insights on the future of Russia and France. And the first question will be uh, addressed to Olivier de Boisson. Uh, so has Russia successfully avoided this, um, the zombification of its private sector? And is it likely to face a wave of defaults? And is it a risk of a structural degradation? Is Russia working on that and how are banks associated to the re refinancing policies of SMEs? I'm sorry, this was a long question. We don't hear you. Your your microphone is a cut. Yes, can you perfect. hear me again? Perfect. Yes, that's I'll perfect. Try to answer quickly. I think the concept of zombification is more pertinent related to economies that had zero level in interest rates like Japan or maybe what is happening in the Eurozone. You know, we have these zero interest rates. It's raised an, an economic debate about uh, does it make sense first or even negative interest rates, does it make sense? And is it a way to, to, to maintain alive, you know, zombie companies that are not productive? I think in Russia, we don't have the same framework. As I mentioned in my introduction, the, the banking sector is now relatively sound, well capitalized. And what we see also is that credit is flowing in, in the sector and interest rates are, again, positive in, in real terms, you know. There is inflation, but long-term interest rates in Russia are significant. 
be about inflation. So I think the issue is not so much about uh, zombification. There is an issue of NPLs, like everywhere, you know, given uh, given the contraction of the economy. I think at the level of NPLs pres presently is not very low, but it's stable and it's very well provisioned, you know. So on the whole, you know, we have a banking sector that is part of the solution, that is not part of the problem in Russia. We have credit flowing in the economy. There is one caveat, which is uh, that the level of uh, corporate debt in Russia is low. When you compare it with other economies, uh, corporate debt goes to 90% of the GDP, which is not low compared to other economies. It's not an Asian type level, you know, like what we see in Korea or China, but it's it's above uh, other other people, you know, the, uh, and, and, and above Western. So this thing, uh, especially that is presently being managed, given that there has been an external deleveraging of the Russian economy, which is the, the, uh, the, there has been rimbo of external debt by banks and by corporates, not to be exposed to functions was one motif, you know. And so all the credit are the dynamic of the resting on the banking sector. So my answer is so far so good. The, I mentioned one caveat about the level of indebtedness of the corporate sector. And the second is, you know, something which makes the, se the, the sector resilient is we have to remember that about two thirds of banking assets public owns. It gives a lot of, uh, and now you know, these public owns are being, I would say, well supervised by the central bank of uh, Russia, which has done a very good job. But it's never less a long term future credit. But I would say that for the moment, it's really it's really in a, in a relatively good position. Thank you very much, Mr. de Boisson, for this reassuring answer. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to move on to our next question, which takes a more geopolitical approach to uh, Franco-Russian relations, and well, more specifically, to Sino-Russian economic relations. This is a question which I'd like to jointly ask to both you, Mr. Erbs, to start off with, and then bounce back to Mr. Lafargue um, in reference to your 2018 paper which I'll talk about a little more in a minute. Uh, Monsieur, in the new context of new sanctions, the development of the Northern Trade Route, and lots of trade and scientific agreements in between Russia and China, and even agreements on potentially uh, capital markets adaptations to encourage um, well, capital market invest investment in between the two blocks, um, would you say that this relationship is now durable? A lot of people in the West especially tend to see it as being a cyclical affair. China and Russia, they periodically in, uh, in good terms, periodically in quite bad terms. Or would you say, and um, would or would you say that the COVID crisis and more recent developments have led this to um, a, de a definitive activation of the Chinese pivot for Russia? Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, for this question. Very interesting. I don't know if he, if I am the right person as a French diplomat to answer this question, but it happens that um, we were working on this topic at the embassy recently, so I'm pleased to share some insight with you. Uh, broadly speaking, I would describe the relationship uh, between Russia and China, and especially the economic relationship as a mariage de raison uh, rather than a mariage d'amour. Uh, the trade and economic relationship between Russia and China is clearly on a dynamic trend. Uh, but in a few words, uh, we can say that uh, this uh, relationship is uh, very asymmetric. When you look at trade statistics, you see immediately that China is a very important partner for Russia. China accounts for 18% of Russia's foreign trade in 2020. While the opposite does not hold true, Russia accounts for only 2.3% of China's foreign trade in 2020. In particular, China has a very strong position on the Russian market with a share that is close to 25% of this market. This is the first exporter to Russia if uh, we exclude EU as a whole. 
without any significant trade arrangement between the two countries because the trade agreement between China and the EEU exists but does not include any tariff cut. Second, this uh, economic relationship between Russia, Russia and uh, China is not very sophisticated, meaning that the inter industry trade is dominating rather than intra-industry trade. Russia is essentially exporting energy commodities to China and has become along the years its main supplier. China is mostly selling equipment goods and machines to Russia. The added value content of its exports has been constantly increasing. In terms of investment and project finance, when looking at some public granular data provided by some institutes, it is obvious that China footprints it in Russia is significant, much more than it is uh, suggested by usual FDI figures. China's investments are highly concentrated on strategic sectors, often related to the Belt and Road Initiative, like energy, raw material transport, agriculture. Going forward, I would say that this relationship, which is clearly ambivalent, will remain so. On one hand, the two countries have some obvious areas of further cooperation, notably considering the geopolitical context and the turbulent relationship both countries currently have with the US and to a lesser extent with the EU. These areas covers, of course, energy, but also aeronautics or the IT sector. China and Russia also have some solid incentives to develop joint de-dollarization strategies and to strengthen integration when it comes to financial and payment systems. On the other hand, there are some hurdles on the way of a deepened relationship between China and Russia. Discrepancies in terms of competitiveness at large means that further commercial integration could be very risky for Russia. From a regional perspective also, China also represents a risk for Russia, the risk of being crowned out from its traditional interland, Central Asia. Finally, when it comes to energy, which is at the core of the existing relationship, one may say that the upcoming ecological transition in China could somehow change the picture. So I think, I hope I answer your question about that's a complicated you point. Did, absolutely, it was fascinating. Thank you, thank you very much for this, for this answer. It's really, really interesting for all of us. And Mr. Lafag, uh, jumping on to you now, in the 2018 paper, you concluded that um, one could not yet talk of a durable alliance between China and Russia. Do you think the situation has changed at all? Did you see it getting worse? Did you see it getting better? Do you see any areas in which China and Russia could cooperate nowadays or any, in any areas in which co further cooperation is now impossible? Uh, we'd love to hear your views on re more recent developments. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think Patrick already answered the questions, in fact. So uh, <laughs> yes, it, it's true that there are a lot of uh, lies. It's true that there are a lot of Chinese competitors for French company here in uh, Russia. Um, it's, um, it's obvious. In fact, um, I mean, the, the answer to your question is also in the geography and history. Um, I, I think the real question is to know why uh, China was not more present uh, in uh, Russia uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. If you look at the borders and if you look at this uh, huge country just next to Russia, and if you see the development of the eastern part of Russia, it's obvious. It's um, so. What, what's happening now is more. Uh, it's more something like a balance. It's more balanced in terms of uh, of relations with the east and relation with uh, relations with the west. So uh, it's true that today um, the balance goes more. Uh, to the East and to China, but it's true as well that there was a lot to do because there was a huge gap between what was a reality and, uh, and, um, and, and, and what was uh, uh, natural uh, trade uh, that should uh, have happened before between these two huge countries. 
So for me, this is the answer. And at the moment, uh, I, I wouldn't say many things have changed, frankly speaking, since uh, 2018. Uh, but we see uh, the same uh, trend and uh, we all see our Chinese uh, competitors uh, here. Uh, in the meantime, um, can I just add, I, I, would, I would like to add just something about uh, our French investments uh, here and uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, I saw that um, I think just after this session, you will have, um, you will have a session with uh, uh, two of our former ambassadors. Uh, Sylvie uh, Tourosha, Sylvie Berman, and Jean de Glignesti. And Jean de Glignesti uh, just published uh, um, a book. Uh, they both public, published a book, but one, one published a book about Brexit and Jean de Glignesti about uh, diplomacy and Russia. And in this uh, book, is, there is a chapter uh, about trade. And what uh, Jean de Glignesti explains very well is that trade between France and Russia has always been for more than 100 years, around 5%. I mean, uh, in the importations of, um, in the part of importation from Russia. What is very important and what makes a huge difference with some other countries is that we have always been very strong in investment. And this is still the case at the moment. Our companies are here. They have invested, and some of them, they have some industrial cooperations with, uh, with Russia for uh, many, many years during the, the Soviet uh, time uh, as well. So I believe that at the moment, and especially considering the challenges after the COVID crisis and everything that was said about social uh, responsibility, about uh, new technologies, about uh, environment, I think we'll have more and more uh, possibilities of uh, investment. So. I mean, the game is not over between uh, the East and uh, the West, let's say. Okay, thank you all very much. I believe we won't have enough time to, uh, to ask another question to all of you. So uh, Benjamin had to leave early because he had another conference right after this one. Um, I thank you all very much for having come. It was a very interesting conference and in which we learned a lot about the COVID omics and uh, the partnership between Russia and France. Thank you, Monsieur de Boisson. Thank you, the, Monsieur Lafarque. Thank you, Monsieur Herbs. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Makarov. We were very happy to have you and uh, I wish you the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.